say got it here. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, there are, as I said, many ways of entering into this question of what is philosophy of science, uh, its relationship to Buddhist thought, its relationship to philosophy of the social, and so on. So let me begin with first a very basic um, entry into certain fundamental questions in philosophy of science, and then maybe say a little bit about uh, Buddhist, um, its relation to one aspect of Buddhist philosophy. Um, you know, much of this, which I'll be saying in short summary form, uh, each of these topics, I've, I mean, I've written extensively on it. I can share the text on that, uh, particularly in the context of Buddhist philosophy and uh, philosophy of science. Um, it's a book called Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, which is largely deals with the idea of Buddhist logic in the context of understanding contemporary science. And you can get all of this from the web because, you know, my students have put all my books on the web, which I said is the best way to get other students to get access to it rather than buy it. And also the book, What is Science, which is published by National Book Trust. And the aim was to introduce philosophy of science to people who are interested in this for a general readership. And that can also be downloaded from the net. So there are these, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to engage with your group even afterwards through emails and stuff. So I hope it will be a conversation which can uh, lead on to, you know, hopefully insights into what you're doing. So let me focus on what uh, Bodhi was saying about two things. One, philosophy of science, specific question of methodology. So first of all, the relationship between philosophy, of si philosophy and science, unlike almost any other discipline, begins as a relationship of, um, you know, two domains which are integral to each other, which have been intrinsic to each other. So if we look at philosophy as the founding discipline, as a mother discipline in a sense, we should remember that uh, science was an integral part of what we call as philosophy, uh, what we call as philosophy today. In other words, much of what you saw as modern science was actually done in the name of philosophy. So the first, I mean, if you want to really look at, um, you know, who were the first early scientists? And when I say that, you should be very careful about using these words, because scientist itself is a term which is coined only in 1834 uh, by Wevel, who was a philosopher of science and a scientist himself. And uh, because they felt there was a need to, to refer to one kind of activity by the name scientist. But no earlier scientist before the 19th century was actually a scientist. Newton, the founding father of what we call as classical physics today or Newtonian physics, was actually called a natural philosopher. That was his official title. And till the, um, I mean, Newton's grand magnum opus, which is the founding book of classical physics, which is called the Principia um, of Mathematical Principles of Nature, um, that, um, that is in 1687, so 17th century. So till 17th, 18th century, scientists, what you call a scientist today, like Newton, were actually called natural philosophers. And what they did, why did they do why were they called natural philosophers? Because philosophers who studied natural phenomena. And Newton is a very good entry into this point because Newton's Principia, the Principia Mathematica book, um, is what is it about? When he talks, he's giving there the first theory of uh, Newton's laws of motion, which all of us have studied in school, right? The three laws of motion, which includes uh, law of inertia, then forces, mass, interacceleration, and so on. And then the famous third law, equal and opposite forces. Now, along with it, it is in that book that he gives us the famous equation of uh, law of gravity. I mean, Bodhi was saying you had a discussion on gravity today uh, or one of these days. So uh, you would have, so the first, first law of gravity, the first expression for it is given by Newton in this book. Uh, why I'm saying this is when Newton is doing this in his book, he's actually referring to what he calls as four principles, philosophical rules of reasoning. He's not talking about scientific rules of reasoning. So what he's saying is, through these forms of reasoning, the way of thinking about the world, I can derive these results. And those reasoning, those rules of reasoning, are the philosophical rules of reasoning. So you go look at it, it's very simple rules of reasoning um, about similarity of causes, etc. But the point is, he's still working within a larger framework of what we call as philosophy. It is only post-Newton 
for various historical reasons. And if there are people who are interested in it, we can discuss it further. But um, for, you know, for various historical reasons, that there comes to be a distinction, a break between the philosophical tradition and the scientific tradition. So one of the important breaks was about empirical nature, that is empiricism, or rather the, the belief that science should be a study of the empirical world. That is, um, when, when we talk about that idea that science is a study of the empirical world, what we are trying to say is this, that you could produce ideas, you could produce knowledge about the world in various ways. And this goes back to one of the founding debates in philosophical doctrine, which I'm, again, if you have discussed this, I'm sure you'll remember the larger aspects of it, but I'm just saying this is the starting point. The debate between empiricism and rationalism, which is one is the argument that all knowledge that we can possess has to come from our experience of the world. So whatever you know has to have been experienced by us. Experience, of course, by the five senses. So we can, so even when you're doing an experiment, you are measuring something, you are still under the domain of senses. There is a, you need that value which is coming from the measurement and that value is a product of the senses. Maybe the number you see or something else which you measure, the sound which you measure, the temperature you measure and so on. So the empirical sensual world gives us information about the world. So unless I taste an apple and it is sweet, I do not know that the apple is sweet. So the question among in particularly in Western philosophical tradition was whether all knowledge has to be based on my empirical experience, on my set of sensations that I have, these five senses, which give me knowledge about the world. Or could there be some other way of getting knowledge about the world, which is not dependent on these, and on these senses? <clears throat> the, very interestingly, the school of rationalism was primarily the argument that you could produce knowledge about whatever it is just by thinking about it, by cogitating about it, by rationally in rationalizing about it. So the idea here is this, you get knowledge about the world from the five senses, but you also get knowledge of, we don't know of what, knowledge just by thinking. And this larger capacity for cogitation uh, led people to believe, particularly Western philosophical tradition, to believe that the knowledge produced by thinking was far superior to the knowledge which you got from the senses. So, for example, I might say that the table is brown as I am watching it. So, I know that the table is brown, but I cannot trust my eyes. I believe, you know, if my eyes are faulty or if the color of the room is faulty or if I see this from a different, you know, different light in the room, that color of the table changes. Whereas in contrast, the knowledge produced by thought alone, a particular kind of discipline thought alone is completely certain. So this belief about the certainty of knowledge arising through reflection and thinking meant that in Western thought, at least, there it comes to be marks a very important difference between the em, from between the empiric, between empiricism and rationalism. And why would we believe in rationalism? We would believe in well, the philosophers, but in the Western tradition, believe paid a lot of attention to rationalism because of the belief of the view that uh, ideas of about mathematics. And mathematics has played a very important role in the way in which Western thought develops, even including philosophy. In fact, as we well know, much of Western philosophy is modeled on mathematics. The attempts to write math to philosophical texts like mathematical theorems is also very well known. Spinoza is one great example of that. The, the point here is this, that mathematical knowledge for a tradition which comes from Plato onwards was believed to be knowledge which is produced not by experience of the world. There is nothing about mathematical knowledge, including one plus one is two or two plus two equal to four, which is dependent on the fact that you experience the world in that manner. And therefore, the two domains which are of great influence on this, one is mathematical knowledge, which they thought was the absolutely certain. There is no cultural ambiguity whether one plus one equal to two, whether in whichever culture you are in, whichever historical time period you are in. Whereas various truths about society, people, food 
tastes, etc., can all change. The empirical world can change its knowledge. For example, a leaf, uh, a tree can be green today. 20 years later, it will be brown in color. You know, the leaves may have turned brown. There is no contingency. So you can see where all the philosophical concepts begin to come from. Contingency, which is just accidental, it so happens that the world is like this, versus necessity, which is the way it should be, which is the way you try to model all truths after. So when you look at mathematical truth, it gives you a fundamental foundation, a model for what we would call as truths in philosophy, and to some extent, truths in science. So this is the major debate at the origin of modern science. One, um, you have this particular tradition of uh, rationalists, who, which include people like Spinoza, Descartes, Leibniz, and others, very influential figures, whose claim is that through cogitation, we can produce the truths of the world. And the other is the world of experience, that everything that we can know meaningfully has to be based at some level in experience. Now, I'll just give you a slight aside before I enter into the philosophy of science. You might ask, why have I not mentioned anything about the Indian philosophical traditions in this? The reason is actually very interesting. The kind of a historical tension between empiricism and rationalism is never felt in Indian philosophical traditions. If rationalism produces knowledge, which is far more uh, certain than the kind of knowledge produced, let's say, through our empirical senses, that should be our aim as philosophers to be able to produce that kind of knowledge, which is necessary and not contingent upon the world. So various versions of this you would have come across in your own philosophical discussions, including the question of a priori knowledge, including the ideas of innate knowledges, self-knowledge, and also, um, you know, other kinds of apodictic knowledge, you know, the whole idea within phenomenology and so on. So there is this very important pressure within the Western philosophical tradition. But what happens in the Indian philosophical schools? And that history is very interesting because Within Indian philosophical traditions, so when I mean Indian philosophical traditions, I'm you, I'm talking, referring to uh, the whole set of traditions ranging from the early Nyaya, for example, to the Sankhya, Yoga, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Navya Nyaya, etc. Okay, Vedanta and so on. Now within this, there are some core disciplines which are very deeply associated with the idea of scientific, whether we call it science or not, a secondary, uh, with questions of logic. So the Nyaya school is about questions of analysis of logic, and so is the Buddhist. And in fact, one of the greatest influences on Indian logic comes from the Buddhist and then later on the Jaina. So both the shamanic tradition produce one of the most fertile treatises on logic. And um, Again, if we can, if there are any specific questions on what kind of logic they are doing, we can talk about it. But it's very interesting to ask why was the question of logic so important? And what were the kinds of tools of logic that were used in philosophical reasoning that were so important for these, for these schools like the Buddhists and the Jainas? But to go back to the origin of modern science, so in this tension between the empirical and the rational, one is trying to see where to fit scientific knowledge in. And in fact, as many of you would know, and I'm just saying this very quickly in passing, one of the most important figures of Western thought, modern Western philosophy, Immanuel Kant, uh, arrive, uh, I mean, as he himself points out, he's trying to find a balance between the empirical and the rationalist, between Hume and Leibniz in some sense. Now, Hume, so Leibniz is a very important figure who gives us one picture of science, which is based on mathematics, which is also the Descartian picture, that Scientific truth should be as pure and as certain and as necessary as mathematical truths. And this also goes back to a very important moment in the origin of modern science, which has become so central to scientific methodology that you cannot understand methodology, in my view, without understanding this historical point of Galileo. So when Galileo, who is often seen historically as the quote-unquote father of modern science, uh, because Galileo is basically, what is he doing? is giving us a physics of motions, how things move, how to describe motions, that's all. And Galileo says something very important and very influential, which has impact even today to the way we understand science. Galileo argues that, you know, what, what is it to do science? And he's giving us a very simple picture. To do science for him 
is to describe the world. That's what all, if you know, as empirical sciences, what do we do? We, uh, we look at a phenomena. I look at an apple in front of me. I describe the apple. I say apple is red, apple is sweet, apple is of this shape, and so on. <clears throat> right? So um, Galileo begins with this idea that science also begins with description. There's nothing very special about it. Even poetry can describe a, a flower. So can science describe a flower. But the difference is this. For Galileo, these descriptions must be in terms of what are called measurable concepts. That is, you only describe them using concepts that can be measured. And if you see in a very simple sense, this is really the origin of what we call the quantitative method in the sciences, which is that why does why is science so concerned about the question of the quantitative? In a sense, the Galilean argument is very nice and very simple for us to understand. So what it means is this. So the simple example I can tell you, which is very close to Galileo's own work, is of a stone dropping. So let's say a stone drops. So let's say this pen, I drop it, it falls to the ground. I drop it, it falls to the ground. Now, this is a phenomena all of us can see. So it's an empirical phenomena, right? Because you can see it. You can test it, do whatever you want with it. Now, but, but the task of Galilean science is to describe this motion and describe it how. I could have described it in so many ways. I can talk about this, the sound it makes as it falls. I can talk about the way the light is reflecting off it, etc. But for Galileo, if you want to give a scientific description of this, he says, describe it using measurable concepts. And the simplest measurable concepts that I can actually do is the height by which it falls, the time it takes to fall, the speed of its falling. So when I use those concepts to describe the falling object, I have actually done some idea of science. That is what it actually means to do science. If you understand that point, you'll understand a lot about scientific method because phenomena can be described in various ways. I, as I said, I can talk about this pen very poetically. I can say, oh, the fluorescent light which is reflecting reminds me of the, you know, the sun as it sets over the Western Ghats or whatever, right? But that is not a scientific description for Galileo because it does not talk about the description in terms of concepts which can be measured. So look at the way in which this impacts social science. So today, if you want to study poverty, and if you want to say, as a social scientist, I want to study poverty, what does it do? Signs of poverty. You can do, you can study poverty. Uh, you can write, you can, there are such moving accounts, both biographical, autobiographical, people have written stories, people have written songs about the pain of being poor. But what does it to mean scientifically to study it? To scientifically study it is not very different from what Galileo said so many centuries back, which is describe that phenomena with measurable concepts. So what does the government do when it does these policies on poverty? It will begin by saying, those who are below poverty line or whatever line of poverty are those who earn less than 32 rupees a day. That's one of the later ones, right? Before that, you had number of calories intake. So if you took calories of, let's say, 1,000 or whatever the number is, which the committee comes up with, anybody eating, getting less than that many calories per day should be labeled as below the poverty line. Now, what they have done is to take a complex social phenomena called poverty and define it in terms of measurable concepts. Once I define it in terms of measurable concepts, it, it has its consequences. It has its function. What it does is it allows knowledge produced about poverty to be converted into a technology of the social science, which is government policy. So I hope you see the point. That is, Poverty as a concept, poverty as an experience, poverty as a phenomena can be very complex and large. But to do science, to give a scientific description of poverty is to be able to use concepts. You can come up with any concepts, like some people came up with per day earnings, per day what they have, uh, daily wages or number of calories or whether you have a phone or whether you have a scooter or whatever it is, right? All of these are concepts which can be measured, which can be quantified. Now, this is the Galilean picture. And in a very simple way, as I said, almost everything you call a science, you can go find a correlate of this. And why mathematics therefore becomes so important is also related to what Galileo describes about nature. He says, well, nature is a 
open book written in the language of mathematics. He gets this idea, of course, from his from his own theology. He is deeply influenced by Christianity, and he is using that image that nature is an open book written in the language of mathematics. And if you are a scientist, all that you have to do as a scientist is to read what is written in that book. So, in a sense, the image of a scientist here is somebody who is a reader of a book, not writer of a book, who is not an author of a book. No scientist is authoring the world's truths. The scientist is a reporter; is nothing but a newspaper reporter, writing down what the truths of the world are. That's the that's the claim. That's the you know the belief about what science really is, and. here the question of mathematics plays a very important role because galileo uh, first he draws the picture from the book of god to book of nature and replaces the language of god with language of mathematics and just says to do science is just to recognize the mathematical patterns in nature and that's why mathematics becomes so integral to what we call a scientific method to the extent that if you do uh, social sciences there is so much pressure on social scientists to do quantitative work or to do mathematical modeling economics has been completely dominated by mathematical modeling and although economics is about people it's about people's transactions it's whether how much i'm going to pay for the coffee you're going to sell for to me right one would think that's about human relation it's human negotiation it's about how we understand each other when i come to your place i may take a, a you know somebody is selling coffee i might pay whatever amount of money i want i can and buy it whereas i may go somewhere else i may not want to pay that kind of money and that depends on the kind of people i am with all of these are factors which are which uh, which mod which for which you need a very different model of humans but when when economics completely converts this transactional mode into mathematical mode which is quantitative and measurable it produces a completely different idea of economics okay so um these are very important influences and they and they uh, become part of what we call as modern science and scientific methodology for a, you know even today in various ways so one of the ways by which this tension between rationalism and empiricism was on the one hand you needed something like the scientific knowledge to be as certain as mathematical knowledge or theological knowledge on the other hand empirical knowledge is always fallible it can always be changing it can always be proved to be wrong etc and it is this attempt to find a balance between this that really defines what scientific method is so in a, if for you to understand why scientific method is the way it is rather than what are the elements of scientific method which i'm sure all of you know well uh, to understand that is to go back to this question of saying well there are some things in nature outside us so we'll begin with very basic presuppositions okay i'm just giving you some map of how to look at it so i'm trying to tell you why the scientific method becomes what it is because they are all based on some philosophical presuppositions so the first pre philosophical presupposition is the world so science will begin with some notion of common sense realism in the sense it begins by assuming that there is a world outside me so the simplest definition of realism uh, again is what something which is independent and outside of me that's it that is the definition of what we would call as real independent of me and outside of me all our ideas of the subject and the object arises from this dichotomy okay so the belief is that there is a world there is a table outside me you are all outside me and you are all independent of me you have your own independent parts you are all sitting in nagpur you are real in that sense because i don't know in what sense you are real otherwise if you ask me why are all of you real why am i real to you is because i am outside and independent of you and there are these other kinds of interactions which follow so that's the first point for science to be possible science does not enter into the philosophical debate of idealism versus realism it is not interested in the question of saying is the world made up in my mind is it my consciousness that is producing the world so this is the idea you know at one end of the idealistic picture what is idealism which is a very important i mean it's a it's such a powerful philosophical insight we cannot run away from this okay remember again in buddhist thought very important group of uh, uh, buddhists are idealists you have 
you know, this kind of debate and challenge is integral to all these philosophical traditions. Idealism is the argument that after all, even if there is a world outside, after all, everything in the world is filtered through me. If I don't, I see the world in a particular manner. And in fact, the problem is this, and that is what comes down to Kant in a very different way. The problem is that just because I see the world like this doesn't mean the world is really like that. Right? That's the fundamental puzzle. That is, just because I see the table as being brown in color is not, the, is not a guarantee that the table is brown in color. Right? You might say the guarantee is all humans are looking at it and the table is brown in color. That is also not a guarantee. First of all, we do not have access to the other people's experience of what the verb table is. And secondly, that is, um, if you have different species looking at the same table, they all look very different. So there are many animals which cannot see the brown color. They have very different levels of color possibilities in animals and creatures, insects and others, and they see the same world that you and I see in a completely different manner. In fact, the room which looks like a rectangle or a cuboid to all of us, the room you're sitting, will actually look curved to many insects, including beetles and other creatures. The way in which something falls, a stone falls, we think, we look at it from outside, oh, this is how the stone falls. That same falling stone falls very differently for other creatures. For example, for uh, mosquitoes and you know, these small creatures, and including rats and other creatures, they actually fall in slow motion. One of the reasons why you can never easily swat an insect. Because when you move your hand, you think you're moving it in a particular speed. To them, they can actually see it in slow motion as to how it moves. Because that's the visual structure which is present in that form. So in which case, what kind of a world is actually real? What is really the property of the world? Is science only describing the property of the world as humans see it? So the question of, so idealism cannot be completely wished away, okay? But science takes a very pragmatic call on this. The pragmatic call is, philosophers can worry about this question, we are not. We are assuming that there is a world outside us, and that world has properties independent of us. And the task of a scientist is to discover those properties of the universe. That's it. Or properties of what they would call as natural phenomena. That's all there is to it. They are not asking the question, are either the humans making up the world? Are the humans influencing what we see in the world, etc.? So the aim of science, right from this particular basis of realism, the belief that there is indeed a world outside us, is what really dictates method. Why? Think about this. What is method anyway? Method is a way of preaching whatever you want to say. Let us say you could call it truth. I'm using it as a very shorthand word, truth. You could say assertion. I want to assert something about the world. I want to say the earth moves around the sun. That's what my assertion is. That's a scientific statement. The sun, the earth, moves around the sun, okay? Now, reality-wise, that's not true because when I look at the sun, I see that the sun is actually moving. Morning, it gets up and it goes up the sky and sets down. I am not the one who is moving. I mean, the earth is not moving. Earth seems to be stationary. When we are all sitting down, we seem to be sitting at rest. So you already had the discussion on relativity, so you must have thought about it. But again, that question about rest and motion, which Einstein comes to in the early 20th century and reformulates a question of what is it to move is the same question which Newton asks in the 17th century. Because as Newton himself says in his Principia Mathematica, he says the whole task of physics is only to know how to differentiate between apparent motion and true motion. That is motion which seems like something is moving or something is at rest. But Newton is saying the same as what Galileo starts with by his analysis of a falling stone or a rolling stone. What is motion? How can science describe motion? 
and in a sense it goes back to the greek tradition to zeus i, I mean to the famous um you know not zeus what is that um, oh god um those paradoxes that I, the arrow paradox and so on ah okay it'll come to me in a second and it is the same paradox which uh, zeno's paradox or not zeus zeno's paradox um and it's the same uh, uh, question about motion which is so wonderfully so critically analyzed by one of the greatest buddhist philosophers and logicians nagarjuna in his mula madhyamika karika you go look at the section on motion okay and you will see the kind of a way of thinking about it so remember whatever it is whether it was uh, uh, zeno or nagarjuna or it is um, you know newton galileo newton and einstein they are only saying there is a phenomena of something moving and i want to understand it that's where all thinking starts whether it's philosophy science whatever it is something is moving i want to understand what is it for a thing to move that's the question what is this quality of movement so very quickly for nagarjuna what would be his quick argument a quality of movement that is if something so this pen moves from here to here the movement is nothing but the statement that the pen was here at this location and then the pen is here at this location and it has taken some time to come from here to here which is our now the most standard definition of motion is what movement from point a to point b in time t right and then nagarjuna says why is this called motion what have you told me about the quality of moving what you have told me is one stationary point and then the other stationary point and something called time what have you told me about that concept that quality of saying something moves something changes you know one of the most profound discussions in my view in how philosophers have thought about the same question of motion as against how scientists talked about motion for galileo and newton and others motion was not this very philosophical question oh what is it really moving etc they said well motion is point the displacement divided by time that's it that's your velocity <clears throat> and velocity captures the quality of motion i mean it 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 needs a lot of philosophical critique right up to leibniz and it's only the discovery of calculus by newton and leibniz that we have a little bit of an idea of how to make sense of it and very interestingly the first examples of this calculus thought actually come from what we call as the kerala mathematical school so there are very interesting ways by which people are thinking about how to make sense of very simple concepts okay so um in a sense what they were all trying to do is to look at a phenomena find some way of talking about it with measurable concepts and in that sense it produces science but that is not enough because it also has to believe that the world is independent of whether it is humans or talking about it or anybody else is talking about it in fact the foundational thing in philosophy in for scientific to understand scientific methodology is the belief that because of this realism you have to somehow remove the human out of the scientific knowledge that is you you cannot allow a human individual to be part of what you are talking about the world when you as a scientist produce a truth about nature it cannot depend on whether it's newton einstein or somebody else because it is not about how humans see the world it is about the belief of science a fundamental belief that the world exists with its own set of truths and independent of us we are only reporters wrote in noting it down and therefore when einstein says e equal to mc squared it is not what einstein's imagination of the world he, he can only be a discoverer he stumbles upon that discovery which is the truth of the world and that's what galileo says all the truths are already written in nature and it's present in front of you but it's written in mathematical language and you have to know that to discover it and therefore 
how do you engage with the question of the human being who is producing this knowledge? Because let's accept the fact, if it was not for Einstein, you would not have had the equation equal to mc squared. I mean, to put it very broadly, you know, um, science has always taken the position that its truths are a temporal, they don't depend on time, a cultural, they don't depend on any human individual at all in producing this knowledge. So Einstein has given us something, but it does not depend on our human capacity. And that is why the removal of the human from all knowledge is the reason why scientific method is what it is. How do you remove the human from what your claims are? For example, you are drinking, you know, okay, Nagpur is famous for orange, right? So you let us say orange is sweet. Now, that's what you think. It's a real, it's a truth of the world. All of Nagpur oranges are supposed to be sweet. Okay, the Nagpur orange is sweet. But when you say that, somebody will say, well, Nagpur is orange is sweet for you. Is it the same amount of sweet for me? Maybe it's not as sweet for me as it is for you. Okay, in the very loose sense, this is the first idea of this, what we call today very loosely as the subjective, which is that truth or that claim depends on the subject who is experiencing it. So, Apple, I mean, orange being sweet, Nagpur oranges being sweet is an experience you have, may not be true for all the humans who may have it. Therefore, that judgment, so when you say Nagpur orange is sweet, it does not become a fact. It becomes philosophical, in the philosophical term would be a judgment. It is a judgment made by the human subject on the orange that you're eating. And you make the judgment that orange is sweet. Now, how does, the question is this, how can you convert your experience of the orange into a statement which is true for all the others? I hope you see this point. That is, how do you move from the subjective to the objective? If by objective we mean that which is common to a larger number. I mean, these are all very, lot of great confusions. There's a lovely work by uh, Lauren Daston and Peter Gallison on the history of objectivity from history of science. You should take a look at it and see how science actually changes the meaning of the word objective in order to appropriate it today. But the idea is very simple. I mean, we don't have to worry about that history. The idea is very simple. For me, the orange is sweet. How do I convert that judgment of mine into a fact for all of you. Can all of us make the same judgment? What should I do in order to make all of you recognize the apple is, I mean, the orange is sweet? What do I do? The idea of method is nothing but this. How do I take an assertion by a single scientist? Because there is no difference between you eating an orange and saying it is sweet, and Einstein saying, oh, according to him, E ego to MC squared. I mean, if you really look at Einstein's 1905 paper, for example, the paper on special relativity, it's quite, I mean, it's quite astounding to see what it actually is. It, I mean, you know, I did when I was teaching uh, this course at uh, the Indian Institute of Science with undergrads uh, on philosophy of science, I actually gave them this paper, you know, Einstein's 1905 paper. And I said, okay, today you guys are all, you know, supposed to be very smart science students would you publish this paper today? Okay, I wanted them to evaluate it. I, did, I didn't want them to say, oh, it's a great paper and therefore it's a great paper. I said, no, look at it, evaluate it. Would you publish it today? And, you know, I was not surprised, but many of you may be surprised that most of the students said, no, they won't publish it. You know, because what Einstein is doing in those papers is something really very different, very intuitive, he is not convincing enough about what he's saying, but it gets picked up for various reasons. And they initially, nobody paid heedance to what he had written till Planck, um, you know, promoted that paper and promoted Einstein, etc. So there are a lot of these other kinds of historical reasons for this to happen. But the aim of science is only to say 
how every the record it recognizes that it is scientists who get insights about the world it is newton who thought oh i should be able to show uh, you know how the earth moves around the sun and that there is something called gravity which is making it go around and remember when newton writes this in his own principia mathematica he writes right in the beginning he says i do not know what this gravity is wiser men who come after me will tell you what it is but he says i'm calling this force this gravity which is making the earth go around the sun okay how can newton's dream imagination poetry of seeing gravity as a reason why earth is going around the sun it's a ghost he's actually seeing a ghost and he says it right in the beginning he says i don't know what it is i'm just saying it he in fact in one description in his book he calls gravitational force like spirits so it's actually a ghost in a sense he says it is there according to me as this and then we'll figure other people will figure it out right but the point is this how does newton's poetry become a scientific fact how do you do it first you have to remove the human being out of that assertion so when you when an individual says when professor bodhi says nagpur orange is sweet if that has to become objective i have to remove professor bodhi from it i have to remove him from it there can be no presence of the human subject in the articulation of a scientific truth so much of what we mean by for example verification falsification 10 people doing the same experiment are all what are all based on an attempt to remove the human from that particular claim of science and the belief is something becomes a scientific truth when it becomes independent of the individual who produces it and the only way so i may do an experiment and i may show something okay now that is still my own production i am present in it the truly a scientific method is one in which you should be able to duplicate that experiment and you should be able to see the same phenomena somebody else sitting in africa should do the same experiment and they should see the same phenomena the belief is that if you keep on verifying it and more and more people verify it more and more chance that that statement is a truth of the world and not just of my imagination i am not producing a story but i am producing something truthful about the world <clears throat> okay so the idea of method in terms of um you know verification falsification um idea of theory and evidence experimental experiment and theory all those correlations and the role of logic within science are all driven by this attempt to erase the human from a statement about the world okay now i'm saying i'm presenting this kind of a point um to you this way interestingly again for those of you i mean since you are interested in method there is a, a book which was published early this year it's a edited volume by geeta chadda and reni thomas it's called mapping scientific uh, methods uh, something like that i should know because um i was a series editor for that and i commissioned them to do that book for routledge it's called it as part of the science and technology studies series and but there there are there are different people from every discipline who has written about the idea of method in that discipline so you know somebody has written on linguistics and method another person on uh, physics and method in physics method in chemistry method in mathematics method in sociology method in literature i did one on method in philosophy and so on so it's a i think a good way for you to see how there can be multiplicity of the ideas of methods but the larger question of scientific method has been dictated by this worry by this one the belief about the reality of the world two that the the belief that scientists task is to discover facts about the world or truths about the world and three to make that truth which the scientist discovers to be independent of that scientist remove it away so unlike poetry uh, look at that i mean you write poetry it's mine it's my expression 
It's not a universal expression. It, that doesn't have to be your expression. Whereas if I say E equal to MC squared, it's not my expression. I am only expressing a truth of the world and therefore it should be as true for you as it is for me, if it is right. Now, okay, I've said all this and I know we are reaching the end, so I'm sorry to go on about this, but I'm, I'm by presenting methodology like this, I'm also challenging you to think about another very important question, which is a question which Professor Bodhi asked us to think about when we started the question about the social and the idea of science. Think about this point. You know, when I did this book, Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, primarily drawing on Buddhist logic, um, I was also responding to, I was, I'd been a part of many of these Buddhist engagement with Dalai Lama and others on Buddhism and science. And the Dalai Lama was very keen about it for whatever reason. I'm, I'm not as convinced by like him about that question of science and Buddhism, but there are other very important entries, modes of entry with Buddhism and science. And one of it is about the question of, as I said, logic. As I said, that book you can just download and read. It's called Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science. Um, if you want a hard copy, of course, it's there in Motilal Banaras Das. But it's, uh, it, it is a really an attempt to try and show how we can look at some of these logical traditions to see its connection to science. But there is a fundamental paradox if you, whenever you want to look at Buddhism and science. And I think it goes back to this question of the social. And, you know, social, I mean, not to me or also to my very good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Gopal Guru, uh, when we did the book on the social, uh, which is called the experience cast and the everyday social, um, we came back to this question, which is published in 2019. Uh, we came back to this question of what is a social dot, dot, dot. There is quite a bit there which has to do with questions of science and so on in a very different manner, um, particularly the authority of the social. But whichever way you want to enter the question of the social, you have to encounter this particular point. For the natural sciences, the humans are just a particular medium to, re to discover some truths. And then they can be cast aside because they are not integral to that discovery of that truth. They have discovered it for whatever reason, we don't know why we need humans to discover the truth. But humans per se are not relevant in this larger project once they have discovered the truth. Secondly, unless phenomena including human being and the human mind can be modeled according to way science models natural phenomena, human is not accessible to science. Humans is not Science cannot understand the nature of being human. And if the very idea of the so social comes from a sense of belongingness of the human, or to use the most important form formulation of the social in my view, uh, something which we discuss in that everyday social and also in a later book of mine on democracy, which draws on Ambedkar's point about social democracy, uh, if Following all that, we recognize that the social is integral. The very idea of the social is essentially related to the idea of Maitri and fraternity. Then it, it, it shows us a very fundamental source of tension between what we call as science and scientific method and what we call as humans as social beings and our own nature of who we are as individuals our own nature of how we relate to each other and our own nature of what should be our mode of relation be. What is this Maitri by which we come together as a social? These are very pro fundamental problems for the larger image of this idea of science where when I said, when every individual judgment has to be converted to a scientific fact by removing the individual out of that judgment. Okay, so that is... I think a very important paradox we have to encounter vis-a-vis -vis the idea of social science itself. And, you know, there is a long history to what social science is and how it came about and its own tension with uh, what we call as science. Uh, but we know why sociology would call itself a social science in a particular way, whereas anthropology is nowadays resisting that idea that it should be called a science for various reasons. Okay, so... Um, can we then study human? Can we understand human the way we understand other natural phenomena? Can we be quantified? If you, can you describe humans 
just in terms of quantitative concepts, it can capture the sense of being human. Maybe it can. I'm not, I'm not going to foreclose it and start with the point that it's impossible to do that. All I'm saying is if scientific method has certain uh, limitations, it has certain strengths. The strength is based on trying to articulate a truth of the world which is independent of human beings. But in the case of talking about humans and the social, this is the central point. So today when you look at uh, psychology, which wants to, psychology is in this kind of a schizophrenic position. It doesn't know whether it's a science or an arts. And it, to show that it is a science, it does experiments, reproducible experiments about mental states, emotions, and so on. So there's a lot of, you know, pseudoscience around what we call psychology, which is what Popper's first critique was about uh, psychology. But um, so you can always describe, I mean, if you describe me by my height, weight, and those kind of measurable qualities, you have objectified me because you have given me qualities which are common to all of you. Everybody can measure my height and weight. It's nothing internal to me, right? And therefore, it becomes an objective statement. But the point is not whether objective statement can be had or not. No, the point is what kind of knowledge you need in order to be able to understand the very nature of humans and the very nature of sociality among humans, you know, and whether scientific method can do this. So, as I said, that's a very different topic and there's so much more we can talk about it. But at least as Professor Bodhi said about scientific method and these questions of, you know, where does the idea of method come from? Why is it that what they tell you as method, why does it come from? Why do we focus on those things? Um, I hope I've given you some insight into how a philosophical understanding of it will try and answer those particular points. I hope I've not confused you too much, um, but you know, if you have any quick questions, and I know it's really this kind of a short thing which I've done, but feel free to any clarifications if you want. Uh, just give me two minutes. I'll ask them uh, uh, some questions, and then I'll, I'll sure. kind of uh, put it okay. to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, come quick questions if you have any. Uh, Akinder, some quick questions. Abhijit. Yeah. How do we look at intuitions in science? Like, can we, like, idealism and realism are there. Okay. So, can we look at intuitions in science? Okay. It, it is also not quantified, but how do we look at it? Okay. Okay, that's one. Uh, some more. Sorry, what is it? I didn't get it. No, I'm just collecting some uh, two, three, so that I'll put it. Uh, you know. Yeah. In, sure. In, uh, yeah. Okay. It becomes easier. I have just missed Okay. What are the kind of debates there? Okay. Two questions. Any other question? Especially related to the, the notion of the social. I think uh, many of the uh, members are still thinking a little bit. Two questions came. Okay. Uh, uh, one was uh, regarding this, uh, this idea of intuition. Yeah. Uh, is there any, in the philosophy of science, is there any, any any kind of discussion happening around the uh, intuition uh, is one question yeah. that came. Yeah. The second one is related to uh, in the way that one has positioned science and the way science has kind of embodied itself in terms of the scientific method and so on and so forth. Uh, and the kind of uh, uh, debates happening now in science, especially quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. This determinism versus probability Mm -hmm. uh, and even in the light of Buddhism, like how would you see Buddhism in the light of this framework of determinism versus probability? So that's another question that came. Can you throw some light on this debate on determinism and uh, probability and what are the latest cutting edge debates there? 
And uh, the third concerns uh, uh, you were saying something about uh, Buddhist logic. Just some yeah. few points, if you can share with us some insights about Buddhist logic, like what is this thing called Buddhist logic and what are kind of premise arguments are being formulated and made? Okay, uh, again, try and be a little bit brief so I don't take another one hour of your time. Um, uh, because all these are very interesting questions, particularly the last one. Um, yeah, the first one about intuition, you know, intuition is a very important idea in philosophy. There are different traditions which have looked at the idea of intuition. And in a very, you know, very um, simple sense, you can understand the idea of intuition as something very closely related to the sensibilities, like our perception, like vision and so on, except it is a particular kind of a perception of your internal mind or whatever it is that is, your consciousness or mind. That is, just like I see the world through my eyes, I see ideas or truth through my mind. So that's why, you know, the famous Descartian notion of mind's eye. Um, but, you know, there's something which people tend to, I mean, especially uh, very skeptical philosophers or in within the tradition of materialists and others, they have a lot of skepticism about it. Uh, one tradition in philosophy which has invested a lot on it is phenomenology. The early founding members of this group uh, in Germany, I mean, within Western thought, uh, is uh, including uh, Brentano uh, and then later Husserl. They all you know, really engage seriously with this idea of intuition. But largely it comes around as that particular way in by which you can access some truths as if you are seeing them internally. One of the very interesting um, uh, groups within, I mean, one of the interesting philosophical branches within philosophy of mathematics or among mathematicians is what is called intuitionism. intuitionism. And there the terminology is very closely related to people, um, you know, philosophers like Cantor and others. Uh, for example, I think Cantor is one who says something like, I can see numbers and sets like I see chairs and tables. So when they are doing math, so for example, this is actually a, this is a way of answering the question, what are mathematical entities? Are they fiction? Are they produced by the human mind? Or is it reality of the world? Do numbers exist in the world? Why should we believe mathematical truths are so true, independent of individuals? So philosophy of mathematics is a domain which looks at these and very other interesting questions, um, also points out that for some mathematicians like Cantor and others, there's a whole group of intuitionists who um, you know, began with this idea that you know, there is a notion of intuitionist understanding of mathematics, which is also influenced by Kant and so on. So there is that kind of a thing. But I think today um, in cognitive science and others, people don't tend to take this very seriously. Why? Because it's not that they're saying there's no idea of intuition. In the more commonsensical way of intuition, it is something which you seem to know like a flash or suddenly out of the blue, you know? And But for the cognitive scientists, they may point out that when you say that, when you say, I have an intuition about it, what it only means is that you are not able to be, you are not conscious of the thoughts which led to that particular idea. You just think that the idea has popped up in your head or that you're suddenly seeing some result in your head. But actually, uh, there is a mental process which has actually solved that problem and then given you this insight and so on. So it is still, um, I think, you know, a lot of debate within cognitive science and philosophy. Question about determinism and probability. Yeah, this is one of the most, one of the most fundamental parts of the discussions in philosophy of science. There was a great movement in when they were talked about quantum theory, of course, early 20th century, which led to very interesting philosophical questions. And among the most important challenge to science was this idea of determinism. And what is the principle of determinism? Just to recap it so that we know in what sense we talk about this term. The idea of determinism is the fact that if you were given a few initial conditions, that is, in other words, if you had given a few input values, then you can predict the output at all times. And the, the success of science is just that. That is, if I want to know what 
an individual, one of you sitting in the room is going to do 20 years from now, then the claim of determinism is that if you tell me 10 information about you, like where are you, what have you studied, where are you from, what is your family background, dot, 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 whatever it is that some people may need, then using just those values, can I predict your evolution through time? That sounds actually quite absurd, right? But why, do, why would science even come to this particular point of view about determinism? One was, of course, a question of mathematics, the universal language, which doesn't change. So once you have a structure of mathematics, it is the same for all time. So mathematics is not time dependent. And therefore, the possibility of scientific truths being time independent because it's based on mathematics is an obvious. It obviously follows from that. But two, the most important reason actually comes from Newtonian physics. And for Newtonian mechanics, or rather classical physics, now in classical physics, if and this is such an important part of how physics looks at the world, is by, is by giving you what are called uh, evolution of a particle or laws of evolution. What does evolution mean? So I throw a stone. Okay, I want to know how it will move through its whole for the next 1 million years. Now, look at this. So the sense of the notion of prediction comes from this. I throw a stone and what do I know when I throw a stone? I know, for example, at what angle I throw it. Okay, I know how much velocity by which I throw it. So if I give you two values, the initial position, where it is starting from, and what is its initial speed by which it starts moving, then Newton's laws of motion will give you the path of that object for all time. And that's what we mean by an equation of motion. Solution of problems in physics are nothing but solutions of equation of motion. That is, once I give you two values, its initial position and initial momentum or velocity, I can track its path and tell you where it will be 10 minutes from now, 20 minutes from now, 40 minutes from now. If you look at how we fire rockets today and you want to send to the moon, it's still using Newtonian physics. There's no quantum physics in sending a rocket to the moon or sending your missiles. You give initial input, okay, what is the initial velocity and some basic conditions, and then I can exactly map its trajectory, its motion, an equation of motion, the laws according to which it moves. That is the principle of determinism in the most important sense of the word. That is, given a few initial value, I can predict its evolution over time. Now, quantum mechanics um, challenges this, and Einstein had a major problem about it. And Einstein could never reconcile himself to quantum mechanics because of this indeterminacy principle. And what is the indeterminacy principle in quantum mechanics? I hope I'm not repeating what your physics person has already taught or your discuss, but just, um, just for completeness, let me say this. Um, what does quantum mechanics do? So I'll give you another example of determinism. So to give you the call. So suppose I have a pen here. When I make a measurement on this pen, right? I'm measuring it. Remember when I'm seeing it, seeing it is a form of measurement. Remember that. Because when I'm seeing, I, let's say my eyes are closed and the pen is there. I open my eyes. I immediately know it's one foot from me. What I've done is I've measured the distance. I measured the distance not exactly, but because there is a particular process of measurement which has happened, which is what? Light rays come from somewhere, fall on this pen and come and strike my eyes. And therefore, I have I give through that, I get an information of how far it is from me or how close it is from me. Okay, that's a measurement. Now, in the case of a pen, I can exactly measure where this pen is, vis-a-vis -vis where I am standing. So I can say it's exactly 10, centi 10 inches from my eyes. And I can also know its speed. I can say it's not moving. It has got zero velocity, zero speed. 
okay just stationary like this and it is exactly 10 centimeters from me so i can give you two initial values i can give you its exact position i can give you its exact speed like i told you newtonian physics you give me position and speed i can tell you everything about that object for infinite time that is under the conditions of newton's laws which are called ideal laws okay well, there's another discussion different kind of a discussion but the point is this pen I know its exact position. I can tell you its exact position. At the same time, I can also tell you its exact speed. Therefore, the evolution of this pen as it falls is completely determinate because I've given you these two values. And of course, some of you might ask why only two values are needed. Uh, just for those of you who have done mathematics or as a background, you can keep in your mind that because Newton's equation of motion is a second order equation, a second order differential equation, it just needs two conditions because it's a second order. And whatever reason, whatever that means, it's two conditions. Okay, that's fine. That's a very simple idea of determinism. In the case of quantum mechanics, take an electron, any subatomic particle, like an electron. I have an electron and an electron is there somewhere. Presumably, that's what scientists tell us. Now, if I try to measure the position of an electron, then its momentum gets disturbed. Its velocity, its speed gets disturbed. In other words, one of the most important principles in quantum mechanics, that uncertainty principle is that you can never get the exact value of both the position and the speed at the same time. One way for you to understand is electron is subatomic particle. And I told you, you know, when you're seeing a pen, Actually, photons strike the pen and come to you. Light strikes the pen and come. So if you imagine seeing an electron, electron is here. To see an electron, uh, light has to strike it and come to me, right? But the moment the light strikes the electron, the electron gets disturbed because it's such a light particle. It's not like a pen. You know, light can fall on the pen and the pen doesn't move. But an electron is so light that when light falls on it, it's, it gets pushed away. It's like a billiard ball, right? It's a ball. You touch it, it falls, moves away. And therefore, the uncertainty principle doesn't allow you to do both together at the same time. Which means what? Which only means that you can never determine exactly the motion of the electron to all times, like you can do for a classical particle. That's the principle of indeterminism. Now, there are various ways by which it gets connected to various philosophical questions and all that. And I said, you know, people are fighting a lot about it. A lot of physicists gave up on Einstein because they said Einstein couldn't accept this. And it was a very theological thing for him, in a sense. And people, and people are trying to say that. Uh, their connection to Buddhism comes in different ways. In fact, this is also very well formulated in another equivalent um, formulation, which is called the wave-particle duality, that an object shows both wave-like characteristics and particle characteristics. And particle means what? Particle means something which is localized. The pen is a particle because there is the pen does not extend all over space. It's restricted. It's got it's exactly 10 centimeter in a width. There is no part of the pen which is in Nagpur right now. This is all the pen is. This is the only space the pen occupies. You know, there is no part of the pen which has leaked onto your uh, seminar hall right now. That's a definition of a particle. Particle which is localized within space. Every object, I take my phone, it is localized in this. I take a whatever you take. You take the earth, very big. Take the sun, which is very big. It is also localized. It's got some specific finite dimension. Your wave, on the other hand, is infinitely distributed. What does that infinite distribution mean? It means that there is some element of that object which can be found very far away. Okay, remember that this pen, okay, one part of the pen is found at this end. Another part of the pen is found at this end, right? Imagine this pen becomes like a long rope. Then, and let's say that rope comes up till Nagpur. Then definitely one part of that rope is found in your seminar hall and one part in my room here. Correct. A wave is one in principle which has infinite extension. And the claim that all 
particles, these subatomic particles behave like waves, means that a single electron, single minutest particle will be spread in principle across the universe. You know, sounds really absurd at one point, right? I mean, you'll only understand it if you think of it as absurd. You can't just say, oh yeah, that's great because quantum physicists did it, then we cannot do philosophy of science, right? Or you cannot even understand physics. Because it's not because somebody said it, but it's to make sense of that concept. And here is where actually a lot of engagement with Buddhism thought happened. Uh, I, there was a, actually there's a talk in, we had done this conference. I mean, the Dalai Lama group had done a conference in JNU a few years back. Ah, uh, must be five, six years back, I think, uh, where the Dalai Lama himself had come. And um, for each of the sessions he chaired, and there were a few of us. So I spoke on this uh, Chatushkoti logic of Buddhists and the wave particle duality. There's a very interesting connection between what kind of logic will help you understand the wave particle duality, you know? Um, anyway, that's, there's a, as I said, there's, there seems to be a natural connection which attracted a lot of people to it. Um, and therefore, you know, in a sense, it kind of leads me directly to the last question on Buddhist logic. There are many aspects of Buddhist logic which are fascinating. Remember that the most important idea of logic, just as a quick, in, just in case those of you may not have come across this, or who have not done logic or philosophy, the definition of logic is nothing but analysis of inferences. When you infer something and you want to know whether the inference is correct or wrong, that is the function of logic. That is the domain of logic. Logic as a subject is a way to understand and analyze whether an inference is right or not. And inference is something we, all, we make all the time. The human mind is one which completely makes inferences. We produce knowledge through inference. So the famous example, again, famous in Buddhist and Nyaya logic, is that when I see smoke, I see smoke, but I infer there is fire. So in other words, I know there is smoke because I see it. Knowledge based on sensation. I know there is smoke because I see it. But even though I don't see fire, I still know there is fire. How did I come to this knowledge? Right? If all knowledge is based only on my perception, then there is no way you can perceive, you can know there is fire. But even though I'm not seeing, because fire is in the back, smoke is coming out. I'm seeing smoke, I've not seen fire, but yet I know fire is there. How did that knowledge come about? If knowledge is dependent only on the senses. So one way in which the Western philosophical tradition would say is it came through this kind of, you know, thinking, thought, etc. In a sense, they all come back to the idea of, um, you know, inferences by which the Nayaikas and the Buddhists, you know, the Nayaikas, the Nyaya tradition is the first tradition which um, produces the first, because earlier to the Buddhist tradition, and they talk about the question of inference. How can you know that the inference to fire is indeed the correct one. So they do that, okay? The Buddhists modify it and build a very, very robust understanding of logic. Um, they're also working with this example, for example, smoke and fire. And they give, so one of the most important logicians, I mean, I, of course, Nagarjuna and others are already logicians and Chatushkoti becomes the first kind of a Buddhist logic. Uh, but the development comes, the higher, more higher order development comes with Dignaga or Dinnaga, 7th century, and then Dharmakirti, um, who develop on this particular logic. There are some really fascinating questions of what they, uh, how they analyze inferences, what kind of inferences can be right and what kind of inference can be wrong. And remember, why are they doing this? They are not doing it. You know, just to say there is fire and there is smoke. I mean, you know fire because you see smoke. They are actually trying to ask, how can our, inf you know, inference is the way we come to know of so many things which we do not perceive, including that of, you know, in theology, including that of God. So even though I may not see God, touch God, dot, 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 I may infer the existence of God. And if that inference is shown to be correct, then God does indeed exist. That is the argument, okay? <clears throat> because even though I don't see fire, I infer there is fire 
I can go check it. Fire is there. Inference opens up a window to knowledge. A lot of mathematical thought is like that, etc. That was the argument. For the Buddhists, they were asking, you know, many, many interesting questions about the kind of, um, you know, inferences we can make. And it's not nearly necessarily theological, but various other kinds of inferences we often make about so many other things. So um, Dinnaga actually gives this uh, wheel of reason, the Hetu Chakra, which tells you, which analyzes each one of the ways by which, which inference is correct, which inference is wrong, under what conditions can an inference be correct, under what conditions inference can be wrong, and so on. Really phenomenal work. Remember, the reason I'm saying is this. Again, it's not just because of God and fire. You remember that most of the concepts we use have been inferred concepts. We talk about space, the reality of space. Is space real? If you say space is real, I ask why? Why do you say space is real? You cannot touch it, see it, hear it. Your five senses cannot access space. And yet we all talk about as if we know there is space. Einstein builds a whole theory on space. Newton builds a theory on space. What is space? How do you? Is space just a knowledge? Is a knowledge of space just a knowledge of inference? And if it is a knowledge of inference, how do you know you're inferring correctly? If not space, ask about time. How do you know that there is something called time? You can't touch it, see it, smell it, feel it, etc. And yet we are all confident that there is something called time in the world. Why would you say that? What is the basis of your inference that even though you are seeing something else, you are inferring there is time? For example, when you see change, when a green leaf becomes brown, you infer there is a period of time which has elapsed. That's an inference. Time is not perception. In fact, Inference seems to be the way by which we derive most of our deeper knowledge from. Perception gives you the basic sense data. But what we do with it through our thinking dot, 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 produces more important knowledge about everything. And that's why it was such an important part for Buddhists. Uh, but of course, you know, there is a long tradition of Buddhists, then the Buddhists and the Navinaya, I mean, the Nyayas, fight a lot about it and then dot, dot, dot. Okay, so very briefly, um, as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to promote my book because you don't have to buy it, you can just download it. But there is, I've discussed and summarized a lot of this ideas of Buddhist logic and its particular connection to science. Um, and there you can also see some very interesting references to other books on. My aim in writing that was to try and introduce people to this very fascinating study of logic. Because when they look at other books, it seems so difficult for people to read. So I thought, what is a way to make people understand why these things which by and then the Jainas do something really remarkably different than the Nayaikas and the Buddhists. And their kind of philosophical tradition is also very fascinating to see. Okay, sorry, I've just been going on, but I think yeah. <laughs> no, I think we've taken so much of your time. <laughs> You're also looking tired. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I had another talk in the afternoon, but that's yeah, I'm totally that's fine. Good. Just my throat is a bit, uh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, so, shall we? Uh, just one, uh, just one last, last question. So sure. if it's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Science can only inquire the things which exist beyond the brain. Science can only inquire the things which exist beyond the brain. Okay. But the science, when it hears the information, the choice that it makes, what to inquire, is not only it is also subjective choice. Okay. Because the what to study, what not to study, is coming out of the subjective choice of the scientist. Okay. So, how do you say? Uh, so, just uh, uh, just quick reflections. Uh, yeah. This element of the subject that you basically mentioned about, uh, sciences claim about. Uh, uh, this idea of objectification of reality, objectifying reality and studying it. But there's this element of intention that arises in the in the scientists. And that intention is subjective. Yeah. Uh, so this notion of, uh, you said something like that, na? Yeah. So how does this, uh, 
so yeah so so and in relation to that uh, especially in the light of the kind of methods that science talks about uh, can you throw some light on how is the observer or the observation conceived like who is this hmm. observer in science and what is the debate concerning observation i think these are the last okay. two questions i'm so sorry it took so much time okay uh, not <laughs> at all okay let me try and um, again very fascinating questions the first point about um you know i mean the observer question is of course very important that that the first point about intention you know how do you how do you remove a scientist away from what the scientist says so for example if the intention of um, um newton for example interesting you know just as to give you a historical example uh, newton thought a lot of what he was doing in physics was a proof for the existence of god in fact he explicitly states that the success of my physics proves the existence of god he was very closely tied to the church and theology his theological interests were far more than his physics they say astrological and theological uh, but is this theory of gravity or is the law of gravity and law of motion dependent upon his intention he may have intended to show this by saying something so this is the point about how an articulation an utterance by any of us i mean can be seen right to become independent of the intention of the speaker sometimes the the phrase can get taken up and it can go outside the speaker's intention but for science it does this methodologically it's not just you know intention is just one part there's a more troubling aspect to science some of the most important discoveries in science have come through accidents it's called serendipity in fact if you look at the number of examples of cases of discoveries which have won nobel prizes which have come through mistakes and through accidental through dreams it's quite astounding you'll see literally hundreds and hundreds of from most important innovations and discoveries theoretical and experimental in science which have happened because not because they were searching for it through a method but through various kinds of accidents there are very many just go to google and put serendipity and discoveries in science you'll see list of millions of them so does it mean that science is scientific idea is just this kind of a vague thing so one philosopher called hans reichenbach tries to answer this question by saying you have to make a distinction between context of discovery and context of justification you can add this context of intentionality to there that is context of discovery or context of intention is what is the accidental accidents which lead you to a discovery or what is the intention of the scientist which leads to a discovery but what reichenbach argues is that context of justification is what we mean by science not the context of discovery that is by accident you may have had a thought an idea has come into your head but it has to be justified and the act of science lies in the act of justification so einstein might have just had an accidental discovery e equal to mc squared okay accidental in the sense it's really his interpretation actually if you look at his papers you will see it's completely an absurd interpretation i mean in the sense it may seem at for his time some crazy interpretation but unless that idea has been justified by the community of scientists where 100 others test it somebody else does experiments to test it somebody tests the mathematics of it and so on only then it becomes scientific knowledge so the production of science is not in getting the idea getting the idea is the first step that's not science science is how does an idea get refined and tested by the community of scientists and then accepted so it can this therefore whether it's intention or accidents etc um the whole idea of scientific method is to produce justification that's why i said removal of the scientist at every level you remove the intention remove the scientist remove the scientist history remove scientist gender caste everything and that's why the indian science community is so casteist it's so much if there's one community in india which has been so anti reservation is the science community you know because they internalize these particular kind of uh, questions to within themselves 
saying that you know context of justification is independent of who is going to be producing this knowledge etc so there are a lot of interesting critique of it also in philosophy and sociology of science but that's really how we can understand that point and that leads to the point of observation and this is also a very interesting blind spot which philosophy of science in so in philosophy of science there are two parts one is analytical influenced by analytical philosophy and one is a continental tradition and of course you know some of us have been trying to argue for the indian traditions like the buddhist tradition and so on but um, in the analytical tradition you know there is no question of observation observed etc it's all based on an assumption um that the human subject i mean even measurement is removed from the human in some sense so measurement can be defined in terms of processes which are not qualities which are not necessarily linked to the human it's a far more uh, you know it's a it's a it's a process so for example when i'm measuring or observing something there's a particular process which happens to me like i told you light has to hit the object and then the light comes into this in fact if you look at all indian philosophy including buddhist writing on perception very fascinating you should read the buddhist nyaya debate on perception conceptual perception or non conceptual perception even their their idea of the what it means to see the light emanating from the eye going to the object coming back etc i mean there are all these kinds of pictures of uh, observations that we have so it's a dynamic process any observation is a dynamic process and but the point is if you want to re remove the human you have to replace the human eye the we who are watching an object by a in not in human eye that has a very different connotation a non human eye like a camera so in a sense to be an observer in science is not to be this human subject with all our histories and so, memories and so on but to replace us with a camera eye which can measure what needs to be measured in this measurable concepts picture right so uh, that's why the question of measurement in quantum mechanics was a big problem because when i told you about the wave particle duality an electron is also a wave but they discovered that when the moment act of measurement of seeing where the electron could be it seems to collapse the electron into an object at that point and therefore the act of measurement seemingly was interacting with that object of measurement that goes against all of classical physics so for example i am i am i am measuring this object let us say i let how what am i measuring i take a scale and i measure the length that's a measurement so i take a scale which is another object a ruler i place the ruler on top of it and measure it and say oh this is 10 cm right i have measured it but the act of measurement has not disturbed the object it has not done anything to the pen the pen remains the same and measurement has not done anything to it right now in the case of quantum objects any measurement disturbs its state like the measurement of an electron from being a wave it can collapse into a particle so that led to the question of whether humans that that quantum mechanics cannot distinguish between the measurer and what is being measured the subject and the object of measurement that led to a very interesting debate in the 30s it also led to um important nobel prize winners who claim that consciousness of the humans is what interacts with the object etc but the scientists don't like any talk of philosophy anywhere so they completely removed that whole kind of questions from that so today i mean they would just talk about it like they talk about measurement of you know like i am measuring um some object nothing happens to the object when i measure it so that's okay so there are ways by which they have tried to get around it but the measurement problem actually raises a much serious question and here is where i think it has very deep connection to the pratyutya samutpada the dependent origination thesis that you cannot ever think of not just measurement of existence of something in a in an essential sense to be independent of a many other things surrounding it and there is that's so there's one of the reasons why with this thought was also gravitated towards uh, quantum theory in some sense but i do think there are some very very important insights one can get from that you know the the the, the impossibility of uh, 
keeping the object and the subject independent of each other. Uh, fascinating, uh, Sundar. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not at all. My great pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to all of you. Yeah, we are so. Uh... And, uh, I'm so grateful to you, and uh, I just hope that probably one day you'll be able to come to Nagpur for a no, day. No, I'd or love two. to do that. We'll, yeah, definitely yeah. we should definitely do that. Yeah. So, uh, no other words. Just uh, from our side, we will just raise our hand to say how thankful we are to you. Thank you so much. It was <laughs> lovely yeah. seeing you all. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank you so do much. Do write if you have any questions. Yeah. Yes. Thanks yes. so much. Thank you so bye. much. I'll get Not back to you later. Sure. Bye, thank bye, you. Bye. Thank you, Vodhi. Bye. bye.